The following podcast was recorded on Tuesday, October 22nd, 2024, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for having me. Today, Jim discusses why long-term yields are rising. Jim, the 10-year yield is up over 50 basis points in the month after the Fed's Fed raised rates. This is the biggest such rise in over four decades. How much of this has to do with the economy? So the simple answer is I think a lot of it has to do with the economy. If we go to the first chart, this is the Bloomberg Surprise Index and its two-month change on the bottom panel. So everybody's clear with what the Surprise Index is, is it takes all the economic data that comes during the month, it compares it to a median estimate of economists. If the number is above what economists think or stronger than what economists think, it gets positive points. If it's below, it gets negative points. It's an exponential six month average, which just means it averages the previous six months of data, but the most recent data gets a higher weighting and the fifth and sixth months get um, lower weightings. Um, the way you want to read this chart, I'm talking about the top half of, the, of this, uh, is if the number is above zero, that means that the X six month exponential average has been above expectations. The data in general has come in above expectations. Below zero means it's become below expectations. And the trend matters. If the chart's trending up, that means it's getting either less bad or better. Or if it's trending down, it means it's getting worse. Um, or less good if it's still positive and trending down. So if you look at the top panel, it's it <laughs> the number is trending stronger. So it is below zero, but not by much now anymore. It might actually cross above zero in the next week or two. Uh, so the data is getting less bad, meaning that whatever economists expect the economy to do, it's not been doing as bad as they think, or you know it hasn't been missing by as much. And if you look at the bottom panel, the two-month change, the two-month change in this data, the, the strong uptrend that we've seen, it's about the strongest we've seen post-COVID. Now, there's been a couple of times where it's been marginally stronger, um, you know, in June of, June of 2023, March of 2020. But the last time it's been significantly stronger in the two-month change, you have to go back to 2017. So what this chart is basically telling me is the data is doing better. It's just the economy is doing better. Or to put it in the parlance that we like to talk about, a no landing. Uh, you know, we're all in the airplanes. Uh, so it's a no landing metaphor. It's not a soft landing. It's solidly a no landing. And then Bloomberg, if we go to the next chart, Bloomberg does uh, break it down into various sectors. And so I pulled out of that the retail and wholesale sales uh, sector. <clears throat> so what is the economy doing for the for the retailer for spending and that number you know is well above zero again this is the surprise index above zero means that the retail data the wholesale uh sector data uh has been flat out beating and it's almost going vertical meaning it is really surprising so what's been driving the better part of the economy has been people going to the store and spending money they're just completely, you know, um, doing that to a degree that this sector has been pulling up the whole economy. So, w point one: why are why are rates moving up after the Fed uh, cut rates? Is this is not the economy that they expected? This is not a, a hard landing or a soft landing. This is flat out a no landing scenario. Jim, how does Fed policy work into this? So if we go to the next chart, let's talk about where Fed policy is, because there's been some confusion about this. Um, and this gets back to my old argument, you know, that are rising rates good or bad? And the answer is they're neither. It depends on why they're rising. Are they rising because we're worried about inflation? That's bad. Are they rising because the economy is getting stronger? That's good. 
So the reason I, I, I put that into perspective is this chart here shows you the probability that the Fed will cut on November 7th. It is at 92% is what the last number is, updated about 20 minutes before we started talking mid-Tuesday afternoon, um, meaning 92% means a 92% probability of a 25 basis point cut, 8% of nothing. And I also, the reason I put this chart in here, so I wanted to point out that since November, excuse me, October 7th, it hasn't moved. It's been around this 90-ish percentile. So for the last two weeks, there's been no movement in the probability that the Fed is going to cut rates. And people have argued that, oh, this must mean that the Fed's backing off on the rate cuts. No, they're not. The market is locked in to this idea that the Fed is going to cut rates again in November. And I would argue that the market is signaling a rejection of this idea and its mistake. So if we go to the next chart, the next chart shows you that what you mentioned at the top, the change in yield since the Fed started raising uh, cutting rates. The 10-year yield is up 55 basis points since September 18th. The other colored lines on this, that's the black line. The other colored lines in this chart are the changes since the other Fed first Fed cuts, the first Fed cuts back to the 1980s. This is far and away the largest that we've seen rates go up. They've gone up by the most. Why are they going up by the most? Because the Fed cut 50, they're going to cut 25. The economy is doing better because all the surprise indexes are going straight up. And the market seems to be saying, we don't need it. And you're giving us too much stimulus. This is an economy that doesn't need chemical assistance to use the metaphor that we like to use with uh, uh, Fed policy. But yet the Fed insists on giving it chemical insistence and it's saying we're going to have bad things happen because you're giving it something it doesn't need. And that bad stuff is either a very, very strong economy, which is bad for interest rates, or you're going to spark inflation and that could potentially be bad for everybody. But nevertheless, I think what the market is trying to tell us combined with interest rates, I mean, excuse me, combined with the economy, is we don't need these rate cuts. So it's not a case of, well, the reason rates are going up is because the Fed's going to back off. No, the reason rates are going up is because the Fed isn't backing off. You know, that maybe they should consider a zero rate cut in November. Now, politically, that would be disastrous for them not to cut rates in November because Why'd you cut 50 ahead of the election? And then after the election, you didn't cut. Were you trying to get somebody elected or not? Now, I've argued in the past, and I'll still stick with it. I don't think the Fed's partisan. I don't think they're trying to pick somebody to get elected. But they're the ones that decided to move 50 basis points before an election. And then the market rejected it with rates going up. So they're going to have to explain it. But I don't think they're partisan. But I also have been very vocal that I also thought that it was a mistake what they've done. So Jim, as you mentioned, the election is fast approaching. It's within two weeks now. How is it going to impact things? Yeah, it's gonna matter. I think it, it, it's gonna matter. So if we look at the next chart, um, the next chart shows in orange, the poly market betting of who's gonna win the election. And let me just go off on a quick tangent. No, this market is not manipulated. I've been involved with the betting markets since the 1990s. I've been playing in them since the 1990s. And losing sides always complain about manipulation. I'll just leave it at that. I don't believe it's manipulated. I believe it's an accurate representation of what people think is going to be the outcome. Just because they think it doesn't mean it's right. Um, just like just because the betters think that you know a particular football team is going to win by three points doesn't mean they win by three points, their best estimate. So the best estimate of the market is orange. The blue line is the 10-year yield. <clears throat> the chart starts the day Biden dropped out. It's hard to tell the difference between the two. <clears throat> so what's the takeaway from this chart? The better the prospects for Trump, the higher the interest, higher interest rates go. And why is that? Let's go to the next chart. The next chart shows the deficit. So up on the top in red line uh, is the deficit. It was $1.83 trillion for the fiscal year. The government uses a fiscal year of September 30th. Everybody else uses December 31st. 
And for, for, so for their fiscal year 24, the deficit was officially $1.83 trillion. Or on the bottom chart, it was 6.5% of GDP. Now, technically that last plot is using second quarter GDP. Next week, we'll get third quarter. That'll be adjusted a little bit when we get that number, but not by a lot. There's a horizontal line in the bottom chart. A horizontal line shows you 6.5% GDP. This is a larger deficit right now than we saw in any of the worst of the recessions in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. So I've, I've made this argument before. We are spending money like we are in the middle of a recession, and we are not in the middle of a recession. We're in the middle of a no landing. Trump wins. This deficit is going to get larger. It's not going to get smaller. Why? Because Trump is talking about no tax on tips, no tax here, no tax there. Last week he gave a speech. He said, maybe we should think about no tax for policemen, firemen, and the military. Now, I'm a Milton Friedman acolyte. Milton Friedman famously said, I've never met a tax cut I didn't like, and I'll agree with that. But if you're not going to offset these things with spending cuts, you're getting less revenue because you're having the tax base get smaller, then all you're going to do is widen out the deficit. All you're going to do is increase the supply of government bonds, and you're going to put upward pressure on interest rates. Now, if we go to the final chart, Trump was 64% to win the election, according to Poly Market. Harris is 36. Doesn't mean it's out of the question. She can't win the election. Um, what if she wins the election? So let me turn it around. Here's federal spending as a percent of GDP. Uh, and on that chart, it shows you September was 23.3%. So roughly one quarter of the US economy is spending, 23.3%. And on the chart, I put the horizontal line there, 23.3. This level of government spending because remember, is higher than, again, like the deficit, any recession we had in the 70s, 80s, 90s. What do we typically do when we go into recession? The government stimulates. The government spends money. The government spends money to try and get the economy moving to get it out of recession. We're doing that now. We're not in recession. The only times we've seen it higher was the financial crisis, and not by much, in 2009, and of course COVID because we mailed checks and that was such a unique situation um, with COVID. But if Harris wins, the argument is spending's gonna go up. And if spending's gonna go up, it's another form of stimulus. Oh yeah, what's the economy doing? It's doing this. And then here comes the government spending money, buying services, buying goods, forcing economic activity and potentially even pushing in inflation. That's why until very recently, with that Trump poly trade in July. You know, I showed it in July, but if I was to show you a version of that chart before July, there was no relationship um, uh, back then. And that's because it's been hard for the market, the big, big top line of the markets to kind of handicap this election because the, the argument was if Trump wins, he cuts taxes, we have a big deficit. If Harris wins, she increased spending, we have a big deficit. So you're choosing between, from an economic standpoint, a big deficit or a big deficit. Now, of course, you can argue from social policy and everything else that they've got various differences, and they do. Foreign policy, they have big differences. But from economic policy and about government spending and deficits, they're kind of the same. And that's the way that the markets until very recently have viewed them right now. So yeah, the election is gonna matter, and it seems like what the market is thinking about is a Trump victory because he's leading. He's not leading by much, but he is leading and he is getting better. And the argument is, yeah, Donald, if you want to cut taxes for no tax on tips, no tax for firemen, no tax for the military, and just keep going down the line, like I said, I'm like Milton Friedman, fine, 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 but you're blowing the deficit out. So where's these spending cuts to offset it? There's crickets on that. So if the market's looking at huge deficits, it's thinking the economy's doing okay, things are kind of rebounding, it's rejecting the Fed, the Fed's cutting rates, and here comes a lot more supply. This is a dangerous cocktail for the bond market. And that's why I think we've seen the bond market's reaction with that big rise in rates, even though the Fed started cutting. 
Jim, thank you for your thoughts today and thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any questions on Bianca Research, Arbor Research, or Arbor Data Science, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks again and have a great day.